Hey guys, today we're gonna to be doing an in-depth comparison of all Fuji's portrait lenses. A year and a half ago, I did a video comparing most of Fuji portrait lenses. However, I'm not super happy with that video. It was rushed, and as a few people aptly pointed out, it was a video about portrait lenses, but it didn't actually have any portrait lens shots in the video. So between that and the addition of an important contender in the Fuji portrait lens lineup, since that time, I figured it was time to make an updated video. But before we dive into that, I do want to thank photosavings.com who are extremely kind and allowed me to borrow a couple lenses that I didn't already own so I could fill in the gaps in the lens lineup. Photosavings is a great place to purchase Fuji gear as well as other camera brands and I'll include a discount code in the description. So looking at all these lenses is a bit of a daunting task. To make it easier to tackle, we'll come at it in two ways. First, I'm gonna compare them all against each other. Then we'll go through each one of them one at a time and talk about strengths and weaknesses, who each one is for and who each one maybe isn't for. And finally, for those who care, I'll be telling you which of these lenses we've decided we will use for our own portrait work going forward. And yes, during the process of making this video, we did change our minds about our favorite Fuji portrait lenses. So if that's interesting to you, be sure and stay tuned until the end of the video. Now also keep in mind that these are Fuji lenses that span the traditional portrait lens of focal lengths. We won't be discussing environmental portraiture for which you may typically want to reach for a wider lens. We will only be talking about the focal lens you would commonly expect to see in headshot or classic portraiture situations. So from 50 millimeters and above, speaking in APS-C focal length terms. Another quick thing to note, I'll be showing you a lot of different photos, but we don't have time in this video to cover every single photo that I took in various circumstances. If you wanna study all the raw photos that I took in various circumstances with the various lenses, I'll make them all available for download in the description below. But be warned, it's a pretty massive collection of photos. Finally, Please check the description or pinned comments for any corrections. I certainly do my very best in these reviews, but I'm only one imperfect man juggling kids in life and I make mistakes. All right, this video is already too long, so let's get down to business. From shortest to longest focal length, the prime lenses we'll be talking about today are the 50 millimeter F2, the 56 millimeter 1.2, the 60 millimeter 2.4, the 80 millimeter 2.8, and the 90 millimeter F2. I also have two zoom lenses, the 50 to 140 2.8, and the 50 to 230 4.5 to 6.7 XC lens. And before you run to the comments and question that last one, give me the chance to explain. I think it's important to mention that while most of these lenses I would squarely label as professional portrait lenses, three of these lenses aren't exactly portrait lenses. Both the 60 millimeter 2.4 and the 80 millimeter 2.8 are labeled as macro lenses, although there's debate, of course, on whether this 624 is actually a macro lens, but we won't get into that. However, I get asked all the time, especially with the 80 2.8, how they do as portrait lenses. So I, I don't think this study would be complete without them. And additionally, the XC 50 to 230, 4.5 to 6.7 is generally considered uh, an all-purpose zoom starter, super zoom starter lens. Um, which is available in some Fuji kits. And many newer photographers do wanna know if this is adequate, if it will work as a, a professional or even hobbyist portrait lens or not. So I felt like it was important to include in this review, but I won't be spending as much time on it. So to begin the comparison, let's start with the most obvious factor, and that factor is price. Prices here are in USD, current as of March 2019. I've ordered the lenses from least expensive to most expensive. Next, we'll look at weight. Again, I've ordered the lenses from lightest to heaviest. If you're anything like me, you appreciate shooting Fuji due to the incredible lightness and the small size of the overall kit. For lengthy shoots, if I can get high image quality out of some of these lighter lenses when shooting for several hours at a time, my wrist will thank me. No surprise here that the 50 to 148 is the heaviest lens, and having used that lens in plenty of wedding situations, I can tell you that sometimes it's worth the sacrifice of flexibility that a zoom can provide to roll with a lighter prime like the 56 millimeter 1.2 which is less than half the weight. Now let's take a quick look and comparison at the build and handling. The 56 millimeter 1.2 is built well, good focus ring damping. My only complaint here is that the focus ring is a bit loosey-goosey compared to the other lenses. It's fairly easy to bump and move the aperture on accident and there's more play 
um, laterally than I'd like to see. The 90 millimeter F2 and the 50 millimeter F2 can sort of be grouped together and Fuji added a nice touch to the aperture rings on these guys where the aperture detents on each major stop are deeper than the ones at every third stop, which is a very nice touch. I'm really happy with the build quality on these lenses and I hope to see Fuji continue with these improvements on future lenses. The 60 millimeter 2.4 is a fairly old build and I think it shows the aperture ring is not as pleasant to use and I don't particularly like the external focusing. With the 80 millimeter 2.8, I'm not sure why they didn't reuse that awesome aperture ring styling of the 90 millimeter and the 50 millimeter F2s. While it feels like maybe it does have have deeper detents um, on each major stop like those ones did, the rings of the aperture are flush with the lens and are more stiff. While this probably helps to not accidentally move the rings when shooting, I do prefer the feel of those F2 lenses. Clearly the 50 to 230 is the cheapest build here. I'm not sure if it's a reflection in the quality or not, but the 50 to 230 is made in China while the other lenses are made in Japan. It's all plastic and the mold lines make it feel and seem really cheap. The focusing ring isn't damped at all, but the zoom ring has a nice feel to it. Although many have complained, and I guess I could agree that it is kind of stiff, hard if not impossible to use with one finger. On the other hand, that is nice because it's not gonna drop when you have it inverted, um, like happens with a lot of the Canon zoom lenses I've noticed. Now, as we know, different lenses do behave differently when it comes to color and contrast. Some of this has to do with lens coating, but it also might be due to computational photography and Fuji actually applying some treatment or correction to lenses during internal processing. As I'm not privy to any product development insights from Fuji, I can only speak to what I see when I look at the raw files. Now, I could have done some color chart comparisons, but as we're looking at these lenses, specifically as portrait lenses in this video, all we really care about is skin tones. As I study the skin tone, of various subjects, I do start to see some differences, and in most cases, I think it's safe to group them a little bit. To my eye, the 50 to 140 and the 56 millimeter 1.2, as well as the 80 millimeter F2.8, stand apart from the others, having a little bit more magenta and maybe a smidge more cyan in the tones than what I see from the others. On the other hand, what I see when I look at the raw files for the 90 millimeter F2, the 50 millimeter F2, and the 60 millimeter 2.4 is definitely leaning into the yellows. One other thing to note is that the 56.12, when shot wide open, loses contrast compared to the other lenses. By f2, the contrast is more comparable, say, to the 90 f2. When it comes to background blur, I feel like the photographic world has a sick and perverse obsession with bokeh quality of lenses and a preoccupation with shallow depth of field capability in general. But I'll try to keep my personal feelings about the subject at bay. I will attempt to steer clear from the reminders that your clients care about what is in focus and not what is out of focus. And that a sharp subject is 90% of the time more important than pleasantly creamy backgrounds at the expense of sharpness. But reminding you of these things won't make me popular, so instead I'll give you exactly the answer to the deep burning questions you have within you. I see your comments, I know your buying habits, and I know your most urgent need is to know which lens you can throw your hard earned money at the soonest, which will provide you the most satisfying bokeh that an APS-C system can provide. So with that in mind, let's compare some bokeh. Now I'm far from an expert here and I'm not even sure what sort of scientific comparison you'd want to conduct to go about comparing blurriness. It all seems a bit silly to me, but from my experience shooting with most of these lenses for a couple years now, and also comparing these photos directly, there does seem to be an obvious hierarchy of bokeh characteristics from one lens to the other. And while the idea of bokeh is extremely subjective, what we can look for are distractions. And the worst performers here in my mind are probably not a very big surprise. The 80 millimeter 2.8 is probably what most would consider the worst contender, but it's more than just because of 
of that 2.8 aperture. Obviously that's going to be part of it, but more than that, the 82.8 has more optical vignetting than all of the other lenses, causing more pronounced elliptical cat's eye style of bokeh, and some may consider that distracting. However, if you tend to like more swirly shaped bokeh, this might actually be the lens for you. The 50 millimeter f2 is probably next. That f2 aperture at the widest focal lengths of the bunch of lenses here means that a similarly framed subject is going to have more defined background as some of the longer or faster aperture lenses. But even more than that, it also exhibits that cat's eye style bokeh balls that the 82.8 does, though maybe not quite as pronounced. For those of you shooting with the 55 to 230 kit lens, you'll find that you can actually get some decent bokeh if you back way the heck up and shoot fully extended at the 230 millimeter length. But even here, the quality won't compete with some of the other lenses, but in my view, it's surprisingly consistent and creamy. Of course, the quality degrades quickly as you close the distance, like in this shot at the 63 millimeter focal length. So while yes, it's possible to get some great quality bokeh out of this lens, it's not very convenient to do so. The other thing to note is the quality of bokeh balls, which when focused at minimum focus are so large that they are clipped on the corners. This isn't due to optical vignetting, but it's definitely unpleasant. I'd put the 60 millimeter 2.4 and the 50 to 142 in the same camp next. Again, the bokeh is probably fine for most portrait lens situations, except for the most ardent bokeh lovers. To me, they both have a bit more definition in the background, and the 50 to 140 is known for the nervous or jittery quality of its bokeh, but you'll only probably notice this when you have extremely busy backgrounds with lots of lines and vegetation. Otherwise, the bokeh quality seems fine to me. Now we get to the Fuji Bokeh Masters, the 56 millimeter 1.2, and the 90 millimeter F2. Most newer photographers are going to assume that the 56 1.2 will have better bokeh with that really low aperture number, but this has not been my experience. After shooting with these quite extensively, I found that the 90 millimeter F2 wins out in almost every way. That longer focal length coupled with that F2 aperture means that portraits will lend themselves to keeping more of the face in focus without as much fast fall off as you get with that 56 1 2. When it comes to bokeh balls, the 90 F2s are far more spherical with better fall off over the very pronounced edges that you get with the 56 1 2. Additionally, with that double sided aspherical element needed to combat chromatic aberration in the 56 1 2, it does seem to me that it creates more onion skinning. And even with the aspherical element, I've noticed more chromatic aberration in the 56 1 2 than the 90 F2. Of course, stop things down and things do change, but I'm only comparing these lenses wide open for the most part for this portion. Some people will bring up the 56 1 2 ADP version, and I have tested that in the past, but the reason for that lens is a bit lost on me, guys. Yes, the apodization filter makes bokeh balls a bit softer on the edges with some gradient you wouldn't see otherwise. To me, it's not worth the loss of low light ability, slower focusing ability, and greater expense in general. That ADP version aside, the 90 F2 really is the clear winner for me when it comes to the Fuji Bokeh King, possessing the least distracting bokeh quality. However, you may be interested in less clinical bokeh. And if that's you, maybe one of these other lenses will give you more character or a certain look that you're after. I'm not judging. When it comes to sharpness, most people tend to make a bigger deal out of it than is warranted, especially where portraits are concerned. I want to make sure we keep things in perspective when we're evaluating these lenses as portrait lenses. If you're photographing average people with average skin quality, in many cases it's actually more flattering to have a little bit of softness in your portraits. And even if you do for some reason want razor sharp focus, usually the corner sharpness is just not all that important. Faces tend to be near the center or the third lines in the composition. Position. Beyond that, lens sharpness more than anything will have a pronounced variation from lens to lens. Your 90mm f2 might have much sharper corner rendering than mine, and all lenses will exhibit different variations of sharpness in all four corners. Yes, even Fuji doesn't have the ability to create 100% perfectly consistent lens glass. The other thing to note is that with one exception, all these lenses, when stopped down a bit, are going to be extremely sharp. In general, f8 is going to be a sweet spot for most of these lenses, so keep that in mind if you feel that you absolutely cannot compromise on lens sharpness in a particular situation. Having said all that, I'll at least show you what I have found with these lenses I have here, you know, for funsies. The 90mm f2 is the sharpest lens overall, and when compared to the 56 1 2, it's sharper wide open, which isn't a huge surprise. At f2, I can't really tell a difference at the very center, but move out toward the edges even a little bit, and the 90 f2 is sharper. The 50mm f2 is next. When compared to the 90 f2, it's 
not far behind though. In my copies, when I compare the 56.12 to the 50F2, the 56 is sharper in the center, even wide open, but the 50F2 is sharper at the rule of thirds lines, and at F8 they are indistinguishable. The 82.8 and the 62.4 are very comparable. Both are a bit softer than the previous three lenses mentioned, but still certainly sharp enough for portrait applications. Not overly surprising, our two zoom lenses take up the rear. The 50-140 is clearly softer than any of the primes, even at the center, even when compared both wide open at 2.8. Here you can see the difference between the 56 at 1.2 and the 50-140 at the 2.8, and the 50-140 is sharper at the wide end, but when zoomed into the 140, where many portrait photographers like to shoot it, it's much softer. The 50 to 230 is the only lens of all these lenses that I would call not very sharp. While all the other lenses are extremely sharp, and in most cases virtually indistinguishable as far as sharpness goes at f8, this lens never quite gets to the same level of sharpness. In this comparison, I won't be looking at vignetting. Again, for portraiture, vignetting matters very little. None of these lenses have any particular problem when it comes to vignetting, even wide open, and even if they did, it's not hard to correct in post. When it comes to focusing, speed, I actually did very extensive testing with all of these lenses as well as with my Fuji wide angle lenses. And I did those tests on both the X-T2 and the X-T3. But we have some definite winners from that testing. Although please keep in mind we are talking about milliseconds of differences here in most cases. And especially slow controlled portrait shoots, this may not matter to you at all. However, if you happen to be using continuous autofocus while tracking children or more lifestyle shoots, which is not unusual for Danae and I, milliseconds of focusing speeds can actually make a difference and will allow you to come away with a higher percentage of keepers. Just keep that in mind and prioritize focusing speed appropriately to the type of portraiture that you do. Here again I've arranged these lenses in order of fastest to slowest. Since I did these tests on both the X-T2 and the X-T3 I averaged the two. Also keep in mind there is a definite speed difference between focusing from close focus to close to infinity versus close to infinity back to cl close to close focus. So the number is also an average of those. Also with the zoom lenses, keep in mind that when shooting at the shorter focal lengths, the lens will focus much, much faster than when zoomed out at the longer end. So here again, I've averaged the shorter and long focal lengths on the zoom lenses to get a similar number for a comparison. Of course, this isn't the fairest of tests because close focus for the two macro lenses slows things down quite a bit for them. If you never use them as macro, you'll find that they are probably more middle of the pack for portrait settings, but if you want to dive deeper into the numbers, I'll make that data sheet available in the link below. Also, I'll have a video out soon that will discuss the differences in the X-T2 versus the X-T3 at focusing speeds with 12 different Fuji lenses because I don't know how to have fun in my free time. For low light, things seem to shuffle around quite a bit, but there's also more wild variation here. The 50 to 140 wins here by a large number, and that's great news for wedding photographers who like to use the 50 to 140. I found the 50 to 230 to be extremely slow in low light and the 828 and the 624 again is probably not as slow if you aren't actually focusing close to macro levels. But again, I was testing for the full focus range of all these lenses, so that's reflected in this data. For those of us who do a lot of portraiture out of doors, we may find ourselves in inclement weather or more pertinent to our situation in sandy, dusty environments. For those occasions, it can be very nice to have a lens with a bit of weather resistance for that extra little bit of reassurance. Here are the lenses that have it and those that don't. Okay, so now that we've gone through and compared and contrasted all of these lenses for what attributes portrait photographers are likely gonna care the most about, let's quickly go through and talk about each one and what sort of portrait lens shooter each lens is gonna appeal to or perform well for and who maybe some of them aren't really designed for. I'm gonna talk about the 90 f2 first because it took home the most awards during the course of my comparisons. No question it wins for bokeh quality. It appears to me to also have the least color shifting happening and I also just really appreciate how it handles the face when shooting wide open. For me, shooting wide open on a 56.12 where you're closer to the subject with shallower depth of field, I really hate seeing so much of the face out of focus. The 90 f2 preserves more sharpness in the face while at the same time really producing Fuji's best bokeh that money can buy, at least in my opinion. It's the fastest of all the lenses at focusing which can be helpful when photographing active subjects and it's a much quieter focusing motor than the 56.12 for video for what that's worth. And while it's definitely an expensive lens, it's more affordable than the 56.12 and for all of these reasons, it's usually the portrait lens that I recommend the very most. However, 
It's not all roses. The hardest thing about this lens is that 90 millimeter fixed focus. It's hard to be able to roll with this lens as your only portrait lens. In other words, this is a difficult lens to commit to if you only want to buy one portrait lens. This lens is also heavier than I would like. It's heavier than the 56.12, which is already a bit weighty. For those really long shoots, it's nice to be able to switch it up with something like the 50 millimeter f2. In fact, if you really want to get this lens, maybe the 50 f2 is a good matching companion to grab along with it. The 5612 is generally praised as Fuji's premier portrait lens offering. It's got a lot of glass to gather all that light and this is absolutely hands down the best pick if you plan to do a significant amount of low light portraiture work. If you're a wedding photographer, I feel like this lens is absolutely indispensable and it would be the very first lens that I would buy. I also think it wins for skin tones as the tone seems to be a bit more natural and a bit cooler. Now as much as the 5612 is praised, it is slightly quirky. Optically it's bokeh is less pleasing to me than, like I said, the 90 f2. It also lacks weather resistance, making it something I tend to baby a bit more than some of the other lenses. It is rather heavy and it is rather expensive. If you're a new portrait photographer who is unsure really how much portraiture you're likely going to be doing, and if you're on a budget, I'd try to steer you towards one of the more affordable options. Honestly, unless you can't compromise on low light, the slight bit of improved shallow depth of field or bokeh quality that this will give you is probably not worth it. But if you do have the cash to burn, by all means, it really is a wonderful lens and it goes with me to every portrait shoot that I do. Coming in at the smallest size, the 50 f2 is excellent for the adventurous portrait photographer who needs as light a kit as possible. It's also the widest of these offerings, so it's the best pick if you happen to enjoy a bit more environment in your shots. It's a fast focuser, it's affordable, it's weather resistant, and to me, all of these things say action and adventure photographer. But it's also a great pick for someone who takes a lot of portraits of family on the go. However, this lens is probably not the right lens for someone who wants a no compromise portrait lens. If you're obsessed with bokeh and shallow depth of field, it does okay, but there are lenses that do it better. The 62.4 is also a bit of a quirky lens. Nothing about it is particularly amazing in my mind. I don't particularly love the build quality. The 2.4 aperture is nothing to write home about and the bokeh is a bit nervous and it's not actually a macro lens, though it's trying to be. I think this lens was a stopgap for Fuji early on. They created it as a pre-56.12 portrait lens and a pre-82.8 macro lens. And I do believe it fulfills both of those roles okay. It's probably a great place to start if you want to do portraits and macro and can't afford the 82.8. The price has also recently come down, which is good, but in my mind, it's still overpriced. I feel like the 50 f2 is a better lens for portraiture and it's more affordable. But if you can find this used for a good price, it certainly can perform as a dual portrait and macro lens, no question. On to the most recent addition to the Fuji portrait focal lens lineup, and this is the one I get asked all the time if it can perform as a portrait lens. That's the 82.8. I will say Say straight away that I absolutely can. I've used this for portraiture myself with my kids during those adventures where I also wanted to be able to capture some macro shots. The image stabilization can actually be really advantageous over some of the other lenses. Some of the things you lose out with shooting a 2.8 aperture with you can gain back by being able to shoot with a more steady hand, although that doesn't matter at all if your subjects are moving. On the other hand, there are a lot of reasons why this isn't the lens you should get unless you're very, very serious about macro. It's extremely expensive, so you'll need to realize what you're paying for at that level. You're paying for image stabilization and the macro focusing ability. But on the upside, I have absolutely no reservations recommending this to you as a portrait lens, if that's you. When I talk about the 50 to 148, I almost always use the term workhorse. That's because the, that's what this lens is. I pull it out all the time because of its versatility. In good light at weddings, it's on my camera probably more than any other lens. I also like it in the studio where I have no need for shallow depth of field, but where I do need high image quality and flexibility. And in outdoor situations, zooming out to that 140 millimeter focal length to take advantage of that greater compression more than makes up for that 2.8 low aperture, even when compared to the 56.12. And like the 56.12, I personally prefer the way this lens renders skin tones to some of the other lenses. The image stabilization is also very nice when shooting stationary subjects or when shooting video. And I've also found weather resistance to be very helpful in many circumstances circumstances when shooting in less than ideal conditions. However, there are certainly some downsides to this lens. It's extremely expensive. It's the most expensive lens we're discussing. It's very heavy. It's the heaviest lens we're discussing. And many people have expressed dissatisfaction 
and a distaste for that jittery or nervous bokeh. For someone who is paying that much money for a lens, they may expect a smoother rendering. Finally, just a couple things to note about the 55 to 230. Hopefully I've demonstrated in this video that this lens certainly can perform as a high quality portrait lens. Of course, it's softer than the other lenses, but I really don't think that will matter in most family portraiture applications. In addition to that, I would give you two caveats when it comes to using this in portraiture. You do need to be shooting closer to the 230 millimeter focal length if you want to be near the same level uh, with subject isolation that you'll get from some of the other lenses, which means backing way the heck up and you need a ton of light. If you're constrained by shooting indoors in less than ideal light or an average to tight space, you may find yourself extremely disappointed with this lens. But if you're doing portraiture outside, I would have no issues at all utilizing this lens, even for most professional portrait shoots that we do. Okay, so as promised, I did want to circle back and tell you what we've decided to change in our lens lineup. When I started this video, I owned five out of seven of these lenses, and I was struggling with the decision of which one I wanted to keep and which I wanted to sell. There's just no reason why we should have that much redundancy in our lens collection. However, during the course of reviewing the XF50 to 230, I actually was impressed so much by it as a lightweight and flexible travel lens. I may have lost control of my credit card and ended up buying it. So as we speak, the only lens of these seven that I do not own is the 62.4. So I've got to slim down this collection. It's getting a bit ridiculous. But guys, I don't have the strength to do it on my own. It's like asking me which of my children to give up. So I did what any rational man would do and I made Danae decide. We did get the help of some models to help us test these lenses out and I gave Danae the task of choosing the two that we would keep and use for our portrait lens work. No surprise here, but it wasn't an easy decision for her to make either. Which other ones can you rule out? Um, 50. I don't like the 50. Why? Um, the focal length, what it does to the face. Okay. It's not my favorite. This is an 82.8 and I really liked that one. It wasn't one of the ones I felt like I was going gaga over. This one's a 90. Yeah. I like this one. The 90 F2? Is that your favorite? It's one of them. The 50 to 140 and the 90. Try the 56 one, two. I, I like how much light it lets in though. Goes yeah. down to 1.2. Right. That's gorgeous. I really want to pick this one, but it's so big and heavy. It so is a beast. <laughs> okay, I would definitely choose 90 as one of my two. Really liking it. See, the only reason I wouldn't, I'm not screaming for this one is because of the weight. Right. I absolutely adore this lens. It's just the really, 50 to 140. The 51 to 140, absolutely adore. It's just really heavy. The 90 would be your next choice because it's lighter, mm -hmm. but it still provides the focal length you like. Mm -hmm. I think if I had to choose two, it'd be the 56 and the 90. The 56 and the 90 are the two that you would choose. I think so. So in the end, here's what we've decided. While I don't think we'll be using the 5140 for portraiture any longer, I do still love having it to photograph our children's sporting events and performances, so I'm gonna hang on to it. And we can't sell the 50 to 230 because I just barely bought it, and that would be completely irresponsible. Also, we can't sell the 5612 because we both love it and we absolutely need it for low light situations. And we can't sell the 90 F2 because we both fell in love with it during the course of this review. I'm sure I've shot it before, but this time it was different as I really dug in. And it was by far our favorite portrait lens in good light and when we have plenty of room to work with. And that leaves us with these two guys. And in regards to the 80 F2, guys, I really, really love this lens. But as it turns out, I just don't ever shoot macro like I wish I did and like I want to. So with a heavy heart, I'm gonna have to put it in the eBay bin. And in regards to the 50 F2, to be clear, both Danae and I really like this lens a lot. It works great as a portrait lens, especially if you want just a little bit more environment it's extremely small size weather resistance makes it just an ideal adventure photography lens but as I look back over the last four months owning it it just hasn't ended up on my camera really all that much so unfortunately it's gotta go 
But as you can see from this exercise that we've done today, all of these lenses have their unique strengths and any of them could potentially serve you well for your portrait needs depending on your situation. So be responsible. Choose the lens that's going to get you the most of what you need for the least expense. Don't make the choice on bokeh or shallow depth of field alone. To all of you who survived it through all that, I really genuinely hope that you found it helpful and I wish you all the best in your buying decisions and more importantly, your portrait photography endeavors. Remember, kindness before cameras. We'll talk to you again real soon.